What is going on everyone? My name is Andy. Welcome back to another FPL video. In this one, it's the Game Week 8 preview where I'm going to go through a bunch of questions and topics to hopefully help you for this upcoming game week. First of all, I wanted to talk about Fancy Football Scout who have kindly sponsored today's video. If you haven't already checked them out, they can help you be better at FPL with their premium membership. There is a link in the description below if you want to get signed up. You can do that on an annual basis or you can just pay monthly if you want to check it out for a few months and then see how you're getting on with it. There's loads of kind of tools over there loads of stats as well so you have members articles comparison tools there's custom stats tables there's fixture tickers there's team planners and a hell of a lot more as well so if you want to check it out link in the description below we're going to use some of the tools throughout this video as well so you can see what they're at i'd highly recommend it great website loads of stuff all under one roof so if you weren't happy enough with all the blanks in game week seven the three postponed matches we got in game week eight we now have a blank game week in game week 12 for just two teams so man city and arsenal are not going to play that week they've had their match postponed Bone, and it's so Arsenal can have their game against PSV rearranged for the Europa League. Now we don't yet know when this fixture will be rearranged but it's likely it will be after the World Cup and not before. So we just have to assume for now the Man City and Arsenal players are not going to play in game week 12 and they're probably not going to have that match rearranged until afterwards. Now this news came out just before I started recording this video. So I haven't fully digested the information but I'm going to try and kind of pay close attention to it when I'm answering all the questions that came in. I know there's going to be a lot of questions about this specifically so I will continue to go through it over the next couple of days before the deadline as well initial thoughts are it doesn't change a huge amount for game week eight wild cards I think you have to have Haaland I think most people were only going to have one Arsenal player anyway which was Martinelli I think some people would have probably considered Edison as the goalkeeper I think you probably have to look elsewhere if you were going to go for Edison you should probably just go for Pope he looks like the obvious one to go for and then the other player is Cancelo now I think if you're on a game week eight wild card you probably just have a plan to deal with him so for example this week he's got wolves away then it's man united at home then it's southampton at home you can probably keep him for that then it's liverpool away and a blank so that might be the week that you get rid of him it does make things a little bit more interesting for those on a game week nine wild card because you might consider going without Cancelo. so for example in my position if i was to wild card in nine i'm not fully decided yet I keep Cancelo for Wolves away, then I wild card him out before Man United at home, Southampton at home, Liverpool away, and a blank. Because I think in two, maybe three of those fixtures, City don't get a clean sheet, right? Again, they probably beat Man United, but could Man United score in that game? I think they could. So this definitely makes things a little bit more interesting, but I don't think it's anything to panic about. I think those of you without a wild card that have already used it, you're probably looking at ways to get rid of your main, uh, Arsenal players sooner rather than later anyway because of the fixtures from game week nine so just something to know game week 12 will be a blank for arsenal and man city players newcastle for anyone that's looking at newcastle defense i think they play everton at home that week so they might be some of the players that you could have on your bench if you've got trippier and you're not going for pope or if you've got pope and you're not going for trippier having a cheaper defender on your bench like botman for example could be a could be a decent option so the first question is about Salah and Trent Alexander-Arnold. And have you ever noticed that Trent Alexander-Arnold is one of those players you can't just say the surname? Like, imagine if I'd started that question by saying, this question's about Salah and Alexander-Arnold. It just doesn't really make sense. You've either got to just say the first name, or you've got to say the whole name together. But anyway, that's besides the point. How should we plan to get Salah, Salah and Trent back easily? Now, you need to do a few things. One, decide when you want them back. Two, decide if you definitely want them back. And then three, how many other transfers you need to to make it's, it's impossible to give a specific answer to this question because everyone's team is going to be set up differently everyone's chip strategy is going to be a little bit different as well so it really does depend so i would look at my team for example and look at these fixtures right so they're blanking this week so this week doesn't matter then it's brighton at home arsenal away man city at home i'm sure most people would be in agreement that they are not absolutely essential for these three weeks but you do need to decide if you want them whether it's both or one of them for Brighton at home bearing in mind Graham Potter's not going to be there anymore I don't think that Brighton is suddenly a really bad team but they might be slightly worse now that he's not there uh, but we'll have to wait and see if that's the case like I watched Liverpool against Ajax last night I think they did a lot better I think defensively they hardly gave up any chances Matip and Thiago are massive players to have back for them interestingly in attack I thought they were better but still not quite 
how I imagine Liverpool playing based off what we've seen over the last few years. The stats might differ a little bit. They did have a lot of shots, but it just felt like something wasn't quite clicking at times. But they still did fine, okay? So overall, I think I wouldn't be panicking too much on Liverpool based on what we've seen so far this season. Thiago and Matic being back is big for them. So if you're if you're willing to wait until game week 12, so West Ham at home, Forest away, and Leeds at home, then you need to decide how many other transfers you're going to make in this slot. So if you're wildcarding in game week 8, for example, and you've already booked in a transfer to do Saka to Zaha. You've got another transfer now to worry about Cancelo, for example. Could Cancelo to Trent be your move? If it is, fine. That's one of the ways you get him back. And then how easily are you leaving open the option to get Salah back? If you're going for Kane up front, that's two transfers to get Salah back unless you go for three premiums, which probably isn't ideal. Or you just have to have a, a placeholder like De Bruyne or Son to then get Salah back in one move. So you need to decide all these things. If you're wildcard and Nate, and then you've got to deal with Cancelo, and then you've also got to deal with two transfers to go Kane to Salah, and you've got something else that's cropping up as well, that suddenly becomes a little bit of an issue. So for those of you on wildcard eight, it might be worth just going for De Bruyne instead of Kane, especially if you're just going to captain Haaland anyway, and just have that placeholder so it's one less move. You will have to leave money in the bank to do that. If you spend all your money and have De Bruyne, it's still going to take two transfers to get Salah back, so keep that in mind. But that's what I would be thinking about. When do you want them back? Do you want both of them back straight away? And then how many other transfers have you got to deal with? If you're someone that is going to be panicking every time the Liverpool game is being played because you really rate these two still despite what's happened, I would think about how you can get them in sooner rather than later. So obviously a lot of people are on wildcard this week. So some of the questions are kind of worded towards wildcarding, but they can be useful for those of you that don't have it or aren't using it this week. Because for example, if you've got Luis Diaz like me, you might be looking at other £8 million options that you can go for in midfield. So this question is, if you had to pick only one on a wildcard, would you choose Madison, Bowen or Zaha? I'm trying not to spread the funds around too much in order to get Salah and Trent back. So that kind of goes to the previous question. How do you get them back easily? Don't have your money all the way spread around so that you can can't get them in one to two moves so definitely think about that I think I would go for Bowen out of these I know he hasn't necessarily performed that well so far the numbers aren't great we'll look at that in just a minute but I think when you look at the if you're wild card in this week then Bowen's got a pretty good fixture Everton away and then the West Ham fixtures after that are pretty good so if we just bring them up on the FPL page so we go to West Ham so Everton away this week then it's Wolves at home Fulham at home Southampton away all these fixtures are fairly good Liverpool away in game week 12 is the toughest one but then they've got Bowen at home this could be the week that you look to possibly offload him but for the next four weeks he looks pretty good with Madison you've got a similar situation where the fixtures are good but the numbers his personal underlying numbers expected goals expected assists are not fantastic so far this season and these fixtures are great right Forest at home Bournemouth away Palace at home Leeds at home you could argue that those fixtures are even better than the are for Bowen but West uh, but Spurs away is not as good this week than what Bowen has with Everton away and also Bowen might be on penalties now so I think he is the one that I would take out of those two and then with Zaha look from game week 10 onwards Zaha is great but I think if you're wildcarding this week and you can only get one unless you've got a really good bench which you probably should have if you're on a game week 8 wildcard no fixture this week then Chelsea at home and look he could of course get something against Chelsea I'm sure Crystal Palace will cause them problems and if they do Zaha is usually at the forefront of that but it isn't a fantastic fixture so I would say the next two for Zaha not really great at all it's game week 10 onwards that you really want him and he is an option then all the way up until game week 16 so he could be your Bowen switch in game week 12 where you go Bowen to Zaha I just think it's a case of looking how the fixtures are ordered right now and probably just choosing Bowen because he's got the best fixture this week and then next week it's pretty good onwards as well I think if you could afford to have two then it's a bit of a different conversation but if I'm just going for one I'd probably go for Bowen at this point unless I've got a great bench in which case I might just hold on to Zaha for a couple of weeks so this is a really good follow-up question to what we've just talked about. Given how much faith you have in expected data, why are you considering Bowen and Madison? The data isn't great for them so far, which is it, which it isn't. You can see on screen for 2022-23, both of their expected goal involvement so far is 0.19 per 90 minutes, which isn't fantastic at all. If that was going to be the case for the rest of the season, I probably wouldn't advise buying them. Now, I, don't, I wouldn't consider myself an expert on expected data and analytics and stuff like that, but I do try and follow a lot of people that 
that are really into it and have provided pretty good advice over the last couple of seasons, which is when I really started to use it more and more. So one is using small sample sizes, right? Yes, okay, after six games, they haven't done fantastic, but that is a very small sample size. We actually have lots of data from previous seasons that shows us that their career expected goal involvement is 0.43 for Madison and 0.42 for Bowen. So we know from seasons gone already that they are good players, right? They're not the same as Salah and De Bruyne and Kane, etc., but they're not priced as players like that. So we know in the past they've been decent. So then we should be asking ourselves the question, is six game weeks enough data to now assume that they're just bad players? Probably not. And also fixtures will come into that as well. So expected data is not just on a personal level, it's also on a team level. So we're looking at the fixtures they're about to have. And again, I know we've kind of just talked about this, but if we go on what Leicester, for example, have, have had so far, and I think Madison, yeah, he started every game apart from the Chelsea game. Well, Arsenal away, pretty difficult. Chelsea away, I know he didn't play, but that's a pretty difficult game for them. Man United at home, that was difficult, right? Brighton away, okay, they got smashed there 5-2, but Brighton defence is pretty good, especially under Graham Potter, right? So they've had some pretty bad results, and I'm not saying Leicester have played well and that we should think that Madison is automatically going to revert, but they've had some fairly tough fixtures. Whereas if you look at the upcoming ones, Nottingham Forest concede a lot of chances, Bournemouth concede a lot of chances. Palace is not necessarily easy, but it's a home game in a in a fix, in a fixture period where they got Forest, Bournemouth, and Leeds. They are fixtures you want to target. So I would look at Madison from game week nine onwards. Yeah, the data has been pretty bad so far, but can that data get better when he plays teams that concede a lot of expected goals? I would say probably yes. And then a similar thing for Bowen. So you're right, the data hasn't been great so far, but we shouldn't be changing our opinions of players too much. You can take note of it. Like Liverpool, for example, people think they're now awful, they're finished, etc. We can acknowledge they probably haven't been as great as they have been in the past few seasons, but that shouldn't now make them awful players and an awful team right and i would say the same for madison and bowen so you're right they are not great but i would expect that to improve with the fixtures as well they've got coming up so this question is about three premium attackers. Could the Threemium re-emerge as an option for those on wildcard? We have the likes of Andreas Pereira, Emerson, and Nico Williams as enablers who you could rotate and play in their decent fixtures. Is it worth it if Haaland is captain most weeks? So that last point is kind of key for me because the likes of Haaland and Kane and Salah, their value lies in captaincy. I've talked about that a lot this season. So it seems counterintuitive to have two other premiums when you're mostly going to captain Haaland because you could look to have more value players in your side. Now just to quickly counter my own point we're only looking for kind of players that are good points per million i.e they're going to outscore their price point up to a certain point right because at some stage you've got to spend your funds so i think having two premiums still works pretty nicely because there might be a week where you actually don't want to captain Harden. i know that seems hard to believe right now but it could happen start thinking about game week 12 the city and arsenal game is off so you can't captain him that week but also it's a structure thing right if you've got Harden, then one of son or de bruyne ready to get salah back or if you even start with Harden and salah and then you can look to switch salah if you wanted to to someone else you're in a much better position to do that if you've got that player already there I know what some people point out that you know if you put the Bruyne there like I've said already and you haven't got money in the bank it's still two moves to get to Salah but you can at least downgrade them to anyone else you want to so I think from a structure perspective it still makes sense to have two I wouldn't say that three is completely out of the question like a lot of people are wildcarding this week with like Pope and Trippier you could put another Newcastle defender in there if you wanted to and go triple Newcastle defense you wouldn't play that every single week you could rotate other players in outside of kind of Bournemouth at home to fund like Haaland and Kane and maybe De Bruyne this week um, but I think long term it's still probably better to have that two premium strategy so it will re-emerge like it always does on wildcard. And I, again, a bit like in game week one, I think it's more viable than it was last season. But for me, I still don't think it's the best strategy and it's probably not something that I will look at. So this question is for those of you that haven't yet activated the wildcard. So what could be the advantages of keeping the wildcard until game week 12 instead of using it for game weeks 8 or game weeks 9, right? Now usually the adva the big advantage is more information. So people will wildcard in game week 8, for example, and they'll get the benefits for the next 4 to 5 game weeks. Then they might run into issues because players come in and out of form. They're in and out of favour. There could be injuries as well. There could be more postponements and stuff like that. So then you get the advantage when you wildcard and you've got all that information. And for your 
next four to five game weeks, it looks even better. And in a normal season, that definitely applies more because you get one wild card for the first half, one wild card for the second half of the season, and there's no unlimited transfers. That extra information advantage this year is definitely lessened because you have to use the wild card by game week 16. So if your team's not set up well now for game weeks eight or nine, I would just use it. I don't think the advantages are so big that you should be looking to delay it. And a lot of that's going to depend on what you've done over the last couple of weeks. So my transfers last week were specifically done because I knew then I would have to wildcard in game week eight or nine, and I was okay with that. If you do want to save it though, there are some advantages, right? And this is the fixture ticker um, on the Fantasy Football Scout members website. If you haven't already checked it out, make sure you do. Link in the description below. You can get signed up as a uh, premium Fantasy Football Scout member, and you can make use of all these other tools they've got on the side as well. But for now, we're going to look at the fixture ticker. Now, it starts in game week eight, and I've set it so it finishes in game week 16. Although the season's not over there, we will have unlimited transfers after that. So there's no point in looking any further than that. Now, they haven't put the blank game week in yet because that's how quickly after the news I'm recording it. But that's what I want to look at. So we already know what the fixture swings are for game weeks eight or nine. So one of the things you can do on this is set the game week to start a little bit later. So we can look at game week 12, for example... Uh, and then we can sort it by difficulty of fixtures. So we'll put the, is that the best fixtures? Sorry, best fixtures at the top, yeah. So you can see here, for example, Liverpool at the top, West Ham at home, Forest away, Leeds at home, Southampton at home, uh, and that, oh yeah, sorry, I've got to set it back to just um, 16 game weeks, yeah. <laughs> game week 16, sorry. Right, so you look at that straight away, and you've got West Ham at home, Forest away, Leeds at home, Spurs away, not great, and then Southampton at home. So that looks to me like a, a set of fixtures where I want two or three Liverpool players. So Trent Alexander-Arnold, Salah are always going to be in, and then maybe even Diaz, because he still seems to be getting great minutes. Even with Jota and Nunez back, they seem to be competing for that number nine spot. So we'll see what happens over the next few weeks, but even Diaz could be an option as well. Maybe you go for a second defender. I know everyone hates the thought of that right now but Robertson and Trent double up could be back on by this point so you could wild card them back in now I would say game week 12 now looks a little bit worse because this fixture against Arsenal for Man City and obviously the Arsenal fixture against um yeah that fixture is basically off so you could look to wild card in game week 13 so the advantages of that would be you can start moving your Arsenal and Man City players on even Haaland possibly you have to take into account the value you've accrued in him you could take them out, you know, it doesn't have to be in game week 12, but they play Liverpool in game week 11. So you could take them out then and then wildcard them back in. Because if you look at the fixtures from game week 13 onwards for City, you got Brighton at home, Leicester away, Fulham at home, Brentford at home. I would definitely want Haaland for those fixtures. I would definitely want Cancelo and I'd probably want another player as well. Now for those people that are wildcarding this week or next week, they might have Cancelo, but I suspect that will now be their route to get Trent Alexander-Arnold back. And that's great for game weeks 11 and 12, but what What's the plan to get Cancelo back from game week 13 onwards? So I think that's your big advantage now. If your team looks good right now, you get added information before game week 13 that could help you. Plus, you can easily deal with that blank in game week 12 because you can remove your City and Arsenal players and then get them back for game week 13. Again, that benefit is lessened by the fact that Arsenal have poor fixtures before game week 12. It's only between game weeks 9 and 12. They only really have that Leeds away game. So most people aren't going to be tripled up on Arsenal anyway. But that is one of the benefits. But I don't think there's a huge amount there. So it goes back to the point I've made a lot this week. If your team needs it in game week 8 or 9, I don't see a huge reason to delay. So this question always comes up in a blank game week. How many players is enough to field this game week if you don't have the wild card anymore? So you need to forget more about the player number and think about the player quality instead. So let's say you've been playing 5-2-3. So a bit of an extreme example, but let's say you've still been on the 5-2-3 formation and your bench is made up of Harrison Reed, Josh De Silva and Lavia as well. Now obviously if you've got Pereira against Nottingham Forest away, I think he's an okay player to play this week for sure. But let's say you've got these three. And if you play them, that brings you up to 11 players. I would say, really, you've only got eight. If someone else has got nine players, but they're not having to play one of these 4.5 million midfielders, they've got good quality players with decent fixtures, like they've got like a Bowen in there or someone like that, a Saka, Martinelli, they are better players. So that person with nine is probably in a better position than you are with 11. So that's what to consider. Now, the next question is, how many hits and stuff should you take to get up to 11 players? That depends who you're going to bring in and how much you want them long-term. 
term. So if, for example, you're going to take Salah out for a hit to get Son in, I would suggest maybe given his minutes, possibly some people think he could be rotated at some point, although it is worth pointing out he hasn't missed a game so far this season. He's always started. But if you had those worries and you're doing Salah to Son, well, that's great. You've got an extra player but you're probably going to want Salah back pretty quickly. Therefore, that's another transfer. That might not be a good use of uh, a move. If, for example, like my team, um, I, I'll show you here for this week. Now, I, don't worry about my team too much because I've not made my moves. But if I've got Luis Diaz, well, he's got a blank this week, then it's Brian. Okay, that's pretty good. But then it's Arsenal away, Man City at home. I can probably just get rid of him. So I probably would just go to Bowen or if you wanted Zaha or Madison or someone else instead, you could go there. But Diaz to Bowen seems like a good move to me that I would be willing to take a minus four for. So it really depends on who the player uh, players actually are before you think about the hits. And it definitely matters the quality over the quantity. So ideally, yeah, of course, you have eight, nine, 10 plus players, maybe even 11. But there's no point in making really short-term moves you're going to have to reverse again suddenly in game week nine onwards so I think it's natural that there's quite a few questions about postponements uh, at the moment, right? We've had the whole of game week seven called off. We've got three matches off in game week eight. We now know that City and Arsenal is also postponed in game week 12. So are more games going to be postponed? I think we have to assume for this week that's not going to happen, right? The police have got together with the Premier League. They've talked about it. They've been told that, you know, Brighton was already off, so that's still off. Chelsea versus Liverpool has to be called off and Man United versus Leeds has to be as well. It'd be pretty unlikely for that to now change before the weekend. But I don't think I can sit here and say 100% certainty no more games will be called off. There has to be some risk just due to all the events that are happening in the UK right now. It might be the police turn around and say, look, we just cannot handle this particular game. And that has to be called off. Now, because of the late notice, I do think that is very unlikely. So if you wanted me to pull an arbitrary number out of the air, I would maybe say there's like a 5% chance that another game gets called off this week, if that. So I wouldn't be particularly worried about it. If you can, I would definitely leave your decisions until as late as possible ahead of that deadline on Friday because if we do get more information you can then react to it it is part of the reason I've not hit the wildcard button yet which I think I said yesterday it's partly because I'm not sure whether to go game week 8 or 9 but I don't want to hit it too early I know there's price rises and stuff like that that could happen but I'd rather have more information especially with everything that's going on right now the Arsenal City game was called off because of the PSV game not going ahead this week with Arsenal so that's the reason that's been postponed I wouldn't foresee too many other postponements after game week nine it can happen of course if they get bad weather and stuff like that games have to be called off it is possible they get postponed but i think it's very unlikely so i don't foresee too many more games getting postponed this week and i think from nine onwards it's probably only going to be that arsenal versus city uh, game that's called off but other than that you just don't know right so there's there's always going to be some risk but i think the risk is quite low so this question is about the second premium attacker. So if you decide to not own Salah, what's the best move instead? Should we move to De Bruyne, Son or Kane perhaps or just spread the money around? So we'll assume that Haaland is the best premium and in this particular um, case, you're just not going for Salah whatsoever. So I wouldn't spread the money around uh, not to the point where it takes more than two moves to get one of the premiums back, because you might not want to go for them now, but you want to leave yourself a route to get to them. And I think the way the pricing is in FPL this season is kind of fair, right? There's not too many players that are overly expensive, so you can easily get a good team and have two premiums. So I wouldn't want to leave myself in a position where it takes three or more moves to get one back, right? Again, I know Harden looks great right now. Everyone's captain in, but that can change easily. Things move quick in FPL. Um, if you're definitely not going to get Salah back, I think Kane is the best option, right? I think he's just as nailed as the other two, if not a little bit more for minutes. He's on penalties. He's played well so far this season. I would definitely have him over Son, and I would probably have him over De Bruyne as well. I don't think Man City's fixtures are so much better than Spurs or anything like that. Kane's more likely to get you a goal, etc. So I think Kane is the one. The only slight issue is a lot of people are liking the forwards right now. So Harlan Mitrovic plus one of Tony, Izak. I'm still going to bang the Solanke drum. I don't think he's a bad option for cheap so because obviously if you go for Kane you take up one of those slots you then have to be happy with the midfield option so for example it could be Kane and Bowen versus De Bruyne and Isaac or De Bruyne and Tony and in that case it makes it a little bit trickier so I think you have to decide if you're willing to give up one of those forward spots but in isolation out of these three Kane is the one I would go for the only other thing to say if you're not completely decided on Salah and you do want a good route back to him then you could go for Son or De Bruyne I'd probably pick De Bruyne right now um, as your kind of second premium just so you've got a slightly easier way to get Salah back you might have to leave some money in the bank to do that but that's worth considering so in isolation yes I do think Kane's the best one out of these three but there's a few factors to consider as well before you make that decision
So there we go. That is the Game Week 8 preview. If you enjoyed that and found it useful, make sure to give it a like and hit that subscribe button if you are new around here. If there's anything else I've missed, I'll try and cover it in the videos over the next couple of days as well. So don't panic. We're still a few days out from the Game Week 8 deadline. Obviously, leave me a comment below if you think there's anything I've missed or you've got anything to say on the stuff that I've talked about in this video. And lastly, don't forget to check out Fantasy Football Scout. There is a link in the description below so you can get signed up as a premium member. Like I said, you can sign up on an annual basis or you can pay on a monthly basis if you just want to check out the tools and see how you get on with them but it can help you be better at fpl lots of valuable uh, tools and articles and stuff over there so make sure to check that out otherwise i'm going to leave that one there thank you very much for watching give it a like hit subscribe and i'll catch you again soon mm -hmm.